You're listening to Reach Teach Talk with Nat Dane. Welcome to season two of Reach Teach Talk. It has been almost a year and a half since our final episode of season one, and a lot has happened in the world since then. We ended the season about three months into the pandemic. We are still in the throes of this pandemic, and in education and learning, we're only beginning to see and be able to forecast the impact of this pandemic on students, on teachers, on parents. Um, We have certainly lived during the remote period of time with school being home and home being school. The environment of the school has become porous, and we are now, uh, in many cases, witnessing our students back in school, yet masked up in most cases and keeping socially distant. But this is a now normal. And when we hear teachers who are looking for restoration, when we're hearing parents who are nervous about their, about their students, about their kids, about what they're bringing home um, in terms of not just the related to the pandemic, but isolation, um, the idea of, of having been physically separated from peers, from, co- from teachers, from other mentors um, for so long, nobody has been able to grow alone. Everybody has had to rely on others in ways that have been unprecedented. And that reliance on others is what we call relational trust. Parker Palmer has written 10 books, and he is just any teacher here uh, in the audience. You, you know his name. You've, 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 read his, you've read his works. You've listened to his podcasts. Um, my father gave me the courage to teach um, back in 1997 when I started out teaching. And this book has been my benchmark as a teacher and a reminder of why I do what I do and what it is about teaching when you put the content aside and you really focus on the relationships. So that much further ado, Parker Palmer, welcome to Reach Teach Talk. We are thrilled to have you here today. Well, thank you, Ned. As a big uh, admirer of your work, it's, I'm delighted to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to get started, actually, and just ask for when you talk about relational trust, what would you, how would you define relational trust? And also, what would you, um, as a, particularly in the, in the context of, of being a teacher? Well, in your intro, Nat, you said something important. You said relational trust is a very nuanced phenomenon, and we want to explore its nuances. And so that is to say it's not easy to nail down. It's not easy to, um, you know, create a one-size-fits-all formula for how to get there. I think we come into relational trust in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, I'm struck by the fact that when you and I started talking 15 minutes before we began the recording, we established some relational trust by sharing personal notes, family stories, asking each other how it's been going. And um, that's an important entree into any, any kind of relationship that might move toward relational trust, which is something I'm feeling right now as we have the opportunity for an open and vulnerable conversation. So I I think for me, uh, relational trust uh, has has a kind of operational definition, which is you know you've established relational trust when two or more people are willing to invest personally in the force field that's being created between them. To to invest personally rather than standing back uh, behind a wall, you know, being masked, trying to play their cards close to their vest, they're willing to risk something by investing in a relationship that is characterized by trust. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to share my bank account with you or my credit card number or my social security number. What it means is that that I have somehow recognized that what goes on, what's happening between us has some importance, uh, however small in the grand scheme of things. And you seem willing to invest in it, to make yourself vulnerable to it. Uh, So I want to reciprocate. And that ups the odds that something good is going to happen, that there will be some fruits of 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 this particular moment of shared labor. 
you know, Nat, I'll, I've always, I could go on and on broader, broader scopes, narrower scope, but I've always felt that um, there are sort of two sources of creativity in life. One is what goes on within us and the other is what goes on between us. Um, and so relational trust is doing the inner work, I think, necessary to come to those in between us spaces and make the very best of them. Is part of what you're referring to the idea of the undivided self, which you speak about often? Yeah, I don't, I think, I think, you know, as you know, I have a, a kind of a longish discourse on the divided life and how it is that <clears throat> having been born whole, as each of us is, whole integral persons, with no wall of separation between our inner and outer lives, we start learning fairly early in life that it's, it's sometimes not safe, maybe often not safe to let what's going on within us out into the space between us because we're gonna get punished or we're gonna get dissed or we're gonna get mocked or ridiculed or shunned if we do. And sadly, there's a lot, I think, in our educational system uh, that perpetuates that building of a wall between our inner and outer reality. Well, if I'm divided from myself, there's no way I can't be divided from other people. You know, if I'm sitting here right now in this conversation, because the examples, the best examples are real time examples, right? So if I'm sitting here right now in this conversation, worried about leaking something that you're going to exploit and run with, um, I'm not. I'm not going to bring that wall down. I, I'm. I'm. I'm going to. My life becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the more walled off I am. Um, the more fearful I become. And the more fearful I become, the higher and wider and thicker I need to build that wall. So it's a, it's a kind of mad spiral down into a, a very dark rabbit hole um, where, where we end up with, um, you know, kind of nature red in tooth and claw, social Darwinism everywhere we look, rather than the kind of trust that we need to create uh, in order to build good stuff in any sphere of life. And it's, I think it's important to name that it's not just education. You know, I think in, in every human relationship, we are asking a fundamental question about whoever it is we're relating, relating to. And that is, is what I see on the outside of this person more or less congruent with, what I, with what's on the inside? Does this person seem to be showing up as him or her self, uh, with you know, reasonable degree of candor and transparency. Um, when the answer to that question is yes, then everything sings. Uh, that's again uh, this this sense that I can invest myself in a relationship where the other person is not hiding behind a wall or wearing a mask. Um, when the answer is no, I can't trust that what I see is what I get, everything falls apart. Everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And that's what often happens in personal relationships. That's what happens in business relationships. That's what happens in politics. I mean, it's happening on, on this very day as we speak. A new batch of headlines is being written about a breakdown of relational trust between citizens and leaders and between citizens themselves. So th it's crucial that we break through on this problem in every way we possibly can. What can teachers do to build relational trust? Um, I'm thinking about, again, this in this pandemic context, right, where also teachers are, 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 they've got, sometimes they've got a full classroom. Most often they don't. A lot of students are out right now uh, and coming back and back and forth. And um, so you don't have the reliance on a full class every day to be able to build that trust, that relational trust. Yet 
despite that, I'm wondering how, how, how as a teacher is relational trust truly built and strengthened? Um, because you're, you're touching on the idea of vulnerability. You're touching on the idea of your authentic self um, being, being your external self, your internal, your external, your undivided self, therefore. Uh, is there anything that you've seen or that in your experience as, as a teacher and as a professor that you've, that you've um, seen as really helpful in building relational trust with your students? Well, well, let's start, let's start with a word about the obstacle or an example of an obstacle, and then let's move beyond that to see, you know, what the answer or a answer to your question might look like. As you may know, for 25 or 30 years, I've been uh, developing a nonprofit called the Center for Courage and Renewal and doing Courage to Teach uh, retreat series with K through 12 teachers, whom I regard as our culture heroes and among our true first responders to the social issues of our time. And I've learned a lot from those teachers uh, as those decades have rolled by. And one of the, one of the things I've learned, uh, and this from a person who never has had a course in education, never don't have a degree in education, didn't go to a school of education, one of the things I've learned from the teachers I work with is that, is that very often in teacher education, they are taught tips, tricks, and techniques, methodologies, strategies for teaching. And, and, the, and the self who teaches is largely ignored, the self who teaches. And in our retreats, one of the things they learn that is helpful is to to more fully bring themselves to, to teaching. And it, I, I remember one teacher who had this revelation in maybe our very first retreat. She said, you know, we've talked in here so much about the self who teaches. I've, in between retreats, I've realized that my self is heavily defined by my sense of humor, and yet I've never felt at liberty to release that in the classroom. Uh, she was she was hiding behind a wall, thinking it was unprofessional to laugh with her students. She said, "I've gone in the time between retreats. I've gone back to class and and unplugged myself. You know, let the humor roll, and it's going so much better for me and for them." Well, it's a small example, but I think if if we think about it in terms of the obstacle we have to climb over, which is this objectification of teaching as, as everything to do with tips, tricks, and techniques, and nothing to do with selfhood. I'm not dissing technique, but it's not fundamental. Uh, it's not the primary driver of good anything. Uh, you know, show me a doctor who uses only technique and another one who uses technique plus personal connection. And I guarantee you that that second doctor will be a more a deeper and more profound healer of his or her patients than the one who clings to methodology only. So whatever you have as a personal gift, and it doesn't have to be a sense of humor, it's not about entertaining people, it's about being real. And just one more thing about that, it, you know, it, it, you, you, you have to, I, I'm not arguing that we should uh, reveal our deepest secrets or the things that you know we're most embarrassed about or the, the most fundamental wounds of our life. Um, I have a, my own story there of three deep dives into depression. And for a long time, I couldn't talk about that because it wasn't fully integrated enough in, into my sense of who I am. That, I, that it would be safe to talk about that. It took me 10 years after my first experience of depression to start writing and teaching about it because I knew it needed to be more fully integrated into a comfortable sense of who I am so, so that I could stand in front of a group or write a published page that said, yeah, I'm all of the above. You know, I'm, I'm, I am my gifts and my strengths and I am also this deep dive into darkness where I wasn't sure I wanted to live anymore. But you don't do that just sort of off the cuff or on day number one. Um, 
And yet when you get to the point where you can acknowledge some of your own limits, when, you can, when teachers can acknowledge the things they don't know as well as what they know, when, when teachers can acknowledge their limits as well as their potentials, what do they do? They create an environment for students who are wrestling with all of those same questions that suddenly feels safer to the students. Because if the teacher can go there, I, I'll be okay going there too. If, the, if, if this is part of the teacher's reality, and kids are pretty discerning about what's real and what ain't in older folk, uh, if this is part of the teacher's reality, then it's okay for it to be part of my reality as, as well. Two years ago, Nat, I would not have believed that you could do it on Zoom. Uh, but I now have two years of working extensively on Zoom with folks in all kinds of situations, some really hardcore social change situations, for example where lives are on the line, where suffering is intense, where people are feeling inadequate to the task, where, where, you know, where, where this, this constant sense is, I'm not enough for this job. I don't have enough. I can't do enough. I'm feeling crushed. And I have found that on Zoom, it is possible to, to be transparent, to be vulnerable, to be candid in, in these thoughtful, measured, bounded ways and heal each other. It's been quite amazing to me. Um, and this is, I'm talking now about around the world, across many cultures, working these past two years with people and situations that at, at almost age 83 now, I could not have traveled to. But in this manner I've been able to connect with. I'm not saying it's easy. I wish we could be face to face, but I don't think that the technology is, you know, for where it's available and it should, I wish it were available more widely to everyone. But when the technology is available, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a deal breaker in terms of establishing relational trust. I've seen too many good things happen so much of what you just shared, I'm nodding because it, it resonates with my year last year. I was running a middle school as an interim, as an interim middle school director at a school here in LA. And I spent about mm, seven months of that time actually running it from Boston and because we were remote and I had personal reasons to be in Boston um, that kept me there. And so I come in and it's this idea of building relational trust where you don't know how tall anybody is. You don't know what they look like from the neck down. Um, they don't know me from the neck down. And um, when you hit leave meeting, it's over. Like you've had your chance at that time. And until next time, it's, it's done. And um, I was really skeptical, Parker, about this job and how successful I might be in this role because I couldn't imagine building relational trust with the faculty, uh, the, my peer administrators, and then ultimately with the students. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure honestly how it went, <laughs> we, it went, <laughs> but I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to write a, a letter to the teachers every day. And if nothing else, I'm just going to do this every day. Even if it's something, you know, that they don't read, it doesn't matter. It's them knowing that I'm thinking of them and them knowing that I've got just this thought that, that maybe might help them as they start the day or not. And that was kind of also my, um, my security blanket, because as long as I wrote something every day, I knew I was making efforts toward building trust. And I, and about halfway through the year, um, I was making phone calls before winter, the winter vacation. And I was calling the teachers individually and just having a chat before we left for our first two week vacation. And I got some feedback from a teacher saying, you know, those letters are, are really well intended and, and they're good, but I can't say that I've read more than 10% of them because I'm just hanging on. Like I just need to focus on my class and I, I just can't um, it almost feels like work to feel like I'm expected to read these letters. And and then, and then the teacher said, but Nat, you know, what really mattered to me in terms of our working relationship is when you devoted that faculty meeting a month ago toward just like throwing out an agenda and just checking in, how are you? Right. 
Let's talk. And, and Nat, you shared part of your struggles um, yeah. Yeah. As, as our administrator, and that made me feel closer to you. Yeah, we always, it's a, those are beautiful examples, Nat. And I, I do think that, the, you know, the letter, it may, may not be that everybody read it, but it certainly was a sign that you care and you care on a regular basis, not just once as a, you know, bullet point in your opening presentation. Um, that makes a difference. And then mixing the work with the, the expressions of being, with opportunities for people to say, this is who I am right now, this is how it's feeling, this is what I'm struggling with. You know, that's vulnerable for professionals, but I think one of the, maybe one of the good things we're learning in this situation is that it's very important for people lifting heavy loads to be vulnerable with each other about how tired they are about how discouraged they are. One of the things that has always amazed me now about retreat groups is that, and I'll, I'll, I'll liken them here to these gatherings where, where we explore our own emotions. A retreat group of 30 people can get together with essentially the same problem. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm suffering from no child left behind or race to the top or whatever. N nobody in the room has a fix, a solution, the solution for that problem. But at the end of a retreat where that has been woven into the fabric of conversation, the solution seems to be that we we feel less alone with it because we've realized that everyone in the room has the problem. And, and we realize that it's not our inadequacy or weakness um, that has kept us from solving the problem. It's a shared dilemma. It's, it, it, I think ultimately uh, that the most comforting word you can hear when you, you, you say, I've got this issue uh, in, in uh, some issue or another in, in whatever dimension of my life is, is you can hear other people say, welcome to the human race. You know, I, I have it too welcome to the human race so that we not normally we have a problem and then we double down on our problem by saying i'm the only one in the universe who has it but in these conversations we realize it's a shared condition and we inspire each other to persist the the, can, the weaving in of isolation to where we've been in the past 2 years plus and looking at community and its role in building relational trust through struggle, through shared experience, through empathy. It makes me think about something you've mentioned in the past about being, we're human beings. We're not human doings. We're not human succeedings. We're beings. We're human beings. We be together. And just hearing what you just shared made me think it, it re-sparked why I went into teaching Parker. My dad was a teacher and the last thing I wanted to do was just imitate my father. Like I love my father, but as a growing, you know, young adult, I wanted to individuate myself. And I thought that if I was a teacher, I would just be defaulting to something that's familiar because I grew up with my father as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Yet I was also a camp counselor and I was also somebody who learned in his teenage years that this idea of um, overnight camp for me was my first true experience in building relational trust. And, and it helped me to individuate and it also helped me to fall in love with teaching as a profession. And the reason why, and I'll take a step back and explain is that at the camp that I went to as a camper and that I was a camp counselor at, it was called Camp Beckett out in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires, beautiful area of the world all boys YMCA camp. And what I remember more than archery and waterfront and, um, you know, campfires is cabin chat. Every night, all eight of us campers in our cabin would be in our bunks after brushing our teeth and all of that. It'd be dark out. And the counselor would come in with a candle and he would sit in the middle of the cabin on the floor. We'd be in our bunks. And we'd have cabin chat 
and cabin chat was a highlight of your day, a challenge of your day, and then a, an unanswerable question. You're not right. You're not wrong. The darkness and the focus on the candlelight, it, it channeled us to focus on listening and to truly listen to our brothers, we would say, in the cabin. And there, were, there was vulnerability there oftentimes, not just when a kid would talk about, a camper would talk about his hardship of the day, the challenge, but also in answering a thoughtful question. And there was a lot of safety in that environment. And I think about cabin chat a lot when I think about a healthy, optimal relational classroom, because, and, and in this conversation, it's helping me to shape what are those elements that made it so effective and that I want to replicate in my classroom and that I'm looking for when I walk into other people's classrooms. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's a very touching story about your camp experience, Nat. It's the kind of story that carries, I think, a, a lot of messages, a lot of truth. What it makes me think of is how ancient that kind of ritual is in the human experience. I mean, for how many centuries, maybe millennia, have people sat around campfires at night, you know, to ward off fears of the dark, to tell stories, to inform each other about what's going on and what we're looking at tomorrow and, and to generate hope that, uh, that as Chris Christopherson used to sing, we can make it through the night. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's a wonderful image and it's precisely the kind of thing we need to be doing. Again, mindful of the fact that professional education educates us away from these simple grounded human things that we need to reclaim because we know we need them. Simple, human and grounded. Yet you don't see it in every classroom. And it's not necessarily, as you say, it's not necessarily fostered by the, the, the schools, the teaching schools. Um, right. Yet it is so, if you were to ask any, most students, you ask them, what is it? Who's your, you never wanna ask who's your favorite teacher because it's never a pecking order in, a, in a, mm -hmm. you know, a spectrum like that, but more like, who's your most impactful teacher? Yeah. At least right now, yeah. right? Yeah, just tell the story of a teacher who has had an impact on your life, yeah. And, and you know, they might start by saying kind of the Robin Williams kind of performer teacher at first or the nice teacher or something, yet ultimately they always come back to the teacher that might actually really be challenging them right now. But what makes that teacher so um, impactful? It's not just that they're that they expect a lot from me, but that they believe in me. Right. And that communication of belief, Parker, is so nuanced. It's you can't learn how to communicate belief in any sort of class. I don't think. I really don't. No. It's got it. It's got only. It, it can only take place when you shape the the classroom ethos to be one that supports vulnerability, hope, um, empathy. Right. Right. We, we absolutely know that. I think, uh, you know, I know in my case, I know, and I've never met a person who's disagreed with this. My great teachers were the teachers who saw more in me than I saw in myself. And, and they found all kinds of ways to communicate that. Uh, and it wasn't just by attaboys and, oh, you're, you're fantastic. Rarely was it, was it that way. That, that can sound pretty hollow. But they would invite me to share in, in some little piece of research they were doing. They would ask my opinion. Um, they would give me tasks that I didn't think I was up to and then mentor me in how to do them. You know, they, they conveyed their confidence in sort of grown up ways uh, rather than infantilizing me by giving me a participation medal or something. Um, or in, I guess the word is pronounced infantilizing me by giving me a participation medal. So I think that's so very important and again, so very grounded, human and simple. Uh, it's The world is full of what I call secrets hidden in plain sight that we just need to recover and start doing. Let's all look for those secrets hidden in plain sight. And as we wrap up this conversation, um, along these lines 
of really encouraging relational trust and, and, and helping to um, maybe hopefully give a shot in the arm for the teachers and the educators who are listening to this episode. Is there any final words that you would like to share to this audience about um, that may have been said or not about just words of hope about this, this period of time that we're going through right now and how through relational trust, there is, uh, it will be better. Well, Nat, um, first of all, thank you for the conversation uh, and power to the teachers who are listening in on this. Um, know that we're thinking about you and that we're grateful for you. Um, so I think, I think I, I'd like to share something that, um, I, that is a way in which I have derived hope over the years. I've been um, a devoted student of great social movements around the world uh, of our time and before our time. And when, when, when you study social movements, let's just take the Black Liberation Movement in the United States, which goes much deeper than the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century. It goes all the way back to 1619 and a lot of things that I hope folks are aware of that shaped and, and misshaped this country of ours. Um, what, what is overwhelming to me as I think about that is the way generation after generation after generation of people, um, who, mostly in this case, enslaved Africans on these shores who had very, very few degrees of freedom, used what few degrees of freedom they had to take a, the next possible positive creative step towards something better. And when you look at the young black people of the mid 20th century who uh, changed the lay and the law of the land, uh, by gathering in places like Selma, Alabama, and bravely nonviolently witnessing and following the consequence of their actions to the bitter end. When you, when you think of those people that have been so transformative in our world, they built upon 12, 13, 14 generations of ancestors taking that long march, small, slow steps at a time. Is it too slow? Sure it is. You know, am I counseling endless patience? Not as a norm, but as something we have to have in order to get anything done. Um, and I, I take inspiration from that, that social change happens in incremental ways. And we have to, we have to value the small, slow steps any one of us can take, rather than throwing up our hands and saying, this whole thing is so overwhelming that I'm just going to bow out. I'm going to find the exit door. Uh, if that had happened historically, nothing would have changed. And I take inspiration from people whose lives were a lot rougher than mine is inspiration to get up every morning and ask myself, what can I do today, no matter how small and how slow I want to do it? You know, that is, that is to me, a real definition of hope right there. The idea of um, when, you were, when you were saying breaking it down into, and, and really honoring the different, the, the steps you're taking, the steps that we're taking, instead of being put off and fearful of just the vast amount, the sheer amount of work. Um, to be done. That is, that is to me a concrete way of, of establishing a hope-filled mindset. Every, every little bit counts. And if we can reclaim our conviction that that's the case, because it is the case, uh, I think we'll, we'll continue to fight the good fight and, and take this somewhere worth taking it. And taking it somewhere that is heart forward, courage being the heart forward, the power of the heart, the core, um, being leading with the heart, right? 
Courage right. to Teach, most right. perfectly apt title for the most, for me, the Bible of my teaching foundation, which is going right up here on my shelf. <laughs> Next to the Wounded Leader, which is uh, a whole other conversation we could have, the idea of the, the vulnerability that comes from acknowledging and really taking a deep study into our wounds and how that helps us um, yeah. not just to heal those wounds, but to present ourselves with authenticity um, and in a way that can engender relational trust. For yeah, that's sure. another conversation. We have to yeah, wrap this one up well, now. <laughs> I hope we'll have it, Matt. Thank you so much for this one. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much, Parker Palmer. And um, anybody who's listening, please uh, visit our website, uh, reachacademics.com, for more information on Parker Palmer, more information on the Center for Courage and Renewal, um, and about his biography. We have a full, full um uh, expose about Parker Palmer on the website. So please visit that and stay tuned for more episodes, but what an episode we just had, what a conversation. And thank you once again, Parker, for joining us and taking the time. Thank you. You've been listening to Reach Teach Talk with Nat Damon. If you'd like to recommend a guest for a future episode, you can send your suggestion or questions to nat at reachacademics.com.